So um, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm uh, Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, which is hosting the webinar today. And we are a founding member of the Sanctions Kill Coalition, which is a coalition of many, many groups in the United States. Many of them are represented here today, and we'll be introducing some of the speakers. Um, uh, some of the groups that are a part of it are the International Action Center, the U.S. Peace Council, IFCO Pastors for Peace, Popular Resistance, the December 12th Movement, Code Pink, Black Alliance for Peace, and many others. Um, if you go to our website, sanctionskill.org, uh, you can um, uh, sign up and join with us. Um, today we're going to hear from representatives of several governments, um, around the world that are affected by U.S. imposed sanctions. These sanctions are especially egregious during the COVID-19 crisis. They are really war by another name and they kill many, many people around the world. During this crisis, the U.S. has upped the sanctions on several countries rather than expressing solidarity and um, trying to help the countries. Um, Part of the sanctions deny many countries medical aid, medical equipment. Other countries such as Cuba have done exactly the opposite and expressed solidarity with countries around the world, have sent doctors, and although they're not a rich country like the United States, have done everything they can to try to uh, stay the COVID-19 um, pandemic in their own country and around the world. So um, tonight we're going to hear from uh, representatives of a number of these countries. We are being broadcast here um, with hundreds have logged on already um, and on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, also Free Speech TV and Radio for All. Um, and the recording of this will be on a number of places and you'll get information on that when uh, uh, after we're, we're done. So I'm going to introduce Sarah Flounders now, who is going to chair the meeting. Sarah is an activist um, in social justice struggles for decades. She helps coordinate the Sanctions Kill Coalition and also UNAC, um, is a contributing editor to the Workers' World newspaper, and coordinates uh, the International Action Center. She helped organize many past campaigns against U.S. sanctions and endless wars I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in and to this very, very strong panel of speakers. We're meeting at a time of great crisis, a global pandemic, an enormous threat with no end in sight. And every rational person knows that the survival of millions depends on a new, higher level of cooperation and planning. And we see the opposite from the U.S. I'm speaking from New York City area with the highest number of COVID fat fatalities in the world. And as in every U.S. crisis, hardest hit are people of color. It's clear that the U.S. government is incapable of even defending the population here a country with the highest level of scientific and technological development, but its resources for years have been spent for a war on the world. And that's the only response. Enormous threat. It's their automatic response. So today we're speaking with countries who have experienced lethal U.S. sanctions as a cause of sickness and malnutrition, death for years. The intensifying economic sanctions, the strangulation tactics on a third of the world's population, 39 countries are now targeted by U.S. sanctions. And every attack comes with an onslaught here in the media of racist demonization. It's actually toxic to the whole political climate. So more than ever, we need during this time of shutdown and quarantine to learn and to begin to mobilize new layers of determination. It's a great honor 
that today there are representatives here from Cuba, Nicaragua, Syria, Venezuela, Iran, and hopefully soon Zimbabwe also joining in a unique discussion. We want to thank UNAC for hosting the webinar and Popular Resistance for streaming it on their Facebook and YouTube platforms. And all of this is an effort to build cooperation in the movement here in the U.S. to link up with movements around the world and to really take action. Sanctions Kill as a campaign and a website for cooperation and solidarity and a sharing of resources is what has brought this together, but it's an effort that needs to expand and it's possible with the real creative participation of so many others. I want to begin today with uh, introducing the uh, speakers. And the, the first, I want to call on Gail Walker. Gail is the executive director of IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, which uh, through the Pastors for Peace Project has organized annual friendshipmen caravans to Cuba to challenge the US government's brutal blockade of this island nation. She's organized numerous solidarity events, medical exchanges, and other solidarity delegations to Central America and throughout the Caribbean. So Gail, uh, we turn it over to you. I just, uh, once again, uh, wanna say thank you, Sarah, uh, for um, uh, helping to coordinate this and um, just wanna say good afternoon to everyone uh, and thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Anna Silva, Silvia Rodriguez of Cuba, the country that uh, has been exposed to the longest running sanctions campaign and a brutal blockade imposed by the U.S. government. Cuban Ambassador Anna Silvia Rodriguez is a graduate of the internationally renowned Superior Institute of Raul Roa Garcia. Throughout her esteemed diplomatic career, she has served in numerous capacities, including positions at the Cuban Embassy in Granada and in Trinidad and Tobago, she, as well as Deputy Director of Multilateral Affairs for Cuba's Foreign Ministry. The ambassador has been a powerful voice advocating for Cuba at the United Nations, where she also serves as Charlotte de Affairs. Ambassador Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Gail. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers of this important webinar and this very crucial moment. I would also want to greet all the audience uh, that I, I have been seeing the, in the screen, have been following us uh, from different parts of the world. And let me start saying that I am a 53 years old and I have lived all my life under the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed by the government of the United States against Cuba. Like me, seven out of 10 Cuba do not know how is to live without this system of Sancho that is the most unfair, severe, and prolonged and ever applied against any country. I have to say that there is not a single, not a single Cuban family that has not endured the consequences of the blockade to Cuba. The blockade to Cuba started at the beginning of the uh, Cuban revolution, but officially started when uh, President Kennedy issued in 1962 uh, a decree, uh, a decree that uh, they say, well, put an embargo on the trade between the, US, uh, uh, between the US and Cuba. Just an anecdote, uh, maybe some of you already read it, that uh, before signing the, the, the decree, President Kennedy asked his aide to buy all the Cuban cigars in Washington in order to have the stock of Cuban cigars before he is signing the decree. Over the years, the blockade to Cuba has been tightened and perfected, and just now it's not only an executive order, is a very complex array of laws and regulation that require both executive and congressional power for them to be undone. 
Um, there is a uh, numerous uh, uh, laws and act that have been signed all over the year, but in sake of the time, I'm going to uh, make reference only to the uh, what is, ha is happening over the last year. You have have been seeing over the last year a very aggressive policy of this uh, current administration, U.S. administration, uh, against Cuba, and they have been tightened and f uh, further the blockade imposed to my to my people, with a more a notable effect in the application of its extraterritorial effects. Just uh, to put some example on how the blockade in the last year have been strengthened and tightened, uh, let me uh, uh, make some example. The U.S. Department has expanded the list, the restricted list of Cuban entities as subentity object of uh, additional sanction to taxes due to the blockade regulation. This measure, not unlike what is also applies to country like uh, Syria or Iran or Venezuela uh, causes uh, considerable damage to the country's economy because of in its intimidating effect in the international business community by openly targeting government and public entities like companies and even hotel. Sometimes even we joke because the one of the company, for example, in the list is a, a factory that produces a, a sodas, like a, our a refreshments. So added to the foregoing is the elimination as of the June, 5th of June of 19, uh, 2019, uh, the general permit for people to people group educational travel the refusal of uh, the refusal to permit uh, non-commercial aircraft to travel to Cuba. Now, after that, they added that no char the charters cannot fly to Cuba, uh, to other cities of Cuba, different from Havana. Now, regular flight cannot travel to other cities from Cuba, different from Havana, and uh, this has uh, an impact uh, in, in in the tourists uh, and also have an impact directly impact in the emerging Cuba uh, private sector. Additional, the U.S. government has enacted an extra strategy to prevent the supply of fuel to our country. We can supply maybe half of our uh, consume, but not 100 percent, so we have to import fuel from other parts of the world. Uh, and it's not that Cuba lacks supplier or that it lacks financial resources to cover our needs, what the U.S. government has done is threaten companies that own the tankers, shipping companies, ship owners, ship flag government, insurance and reinsurance company from different uh, markets, from South America, from Europe, from North America, without, without having any legal or moral authority to do that. To do that. One of the most significant measures that the U.S. government has adopted last year, and all, most of you know, it was the activation of Title III and Title IV of the uh, helms burton Act. To add insult to the injury, the U.S. government has not even considered suspending, let alone, of course, lifting any of its sanction program in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Countries like mine, who already battle on a daily basis with this obstacle, now have to rely even more than ever on the solidarity and the bravery of those willing to defy the U.S. government and help us to contribute to defeating this deadly virus. The COVID-19 pandemic is underscoring the malice and the cruelty of the U.S. blockade against Cuba, a policy that has been always an inhumane policy designed to target and punish an entire population. Today, Cuba is more than ever limited in its ability to push medicines, medical equipment, and other necessary supplies to face the pandemic. I'm not going to talk too much about this now because maybe in later we can we can elaborate uh, further on the example on how the, the blockade to Cuba is is hinder our uh, fight against the pandemic. Despite the attempt by hanging a ranking official of the U.S. government to deceive the world by saying that its sanctions are aimed to do harm to the government 
and not to the people of Cuba, it is clear that the economic, commercial, and financial war against Cuba is aimed at killing the people, bringing about hunger, disease, and desperation in order that the people blame the system for their hardship. And this is this uh, conception starts from since the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, and it's very well written in a memorandum uh, written by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the State uh, for uh, Internal Inter-American Affair in 1960. So this is the true nature of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed, uh, imposed to Cuba by the United States government. And while the United States government pursues the path of unital, unital, unilateralism and confrontation, my country continues to believe that only together through multilateralism and international cooperation and from not politicized approach will humanity be able to tackle this pandemic or any other pandemic uh, and global challenge. We are continue of fully committed to do our part on the, this present circumstances. So Cuba, uh, we are overcoming the wide impact of the US blockade on our people and economy. And that's the reason why we continue uh, showing and bringing solidarity to the world. I'm going to stop here. And once again, I would like to, to reiterate our deepest uh, thank to all of you and um, for your support all over the years to the Cuban Revolution and also for your standing position against the uh, blockade to Cuba. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ana Silva Rodriguez. And we will come back to each representative for uh, a Q and A session, so please all do stay with us. Uh, we next want to invite Om Harriet of the December Twelfth Movement. Omawali has traveled many times to Zimbabwe and organized solidarity with Zimbabwe for decades of U.S. and British sanctions, and in defense of the movement in Zimbabwe for self determination. Now, due to technical difficulties today with linking with Zimbabwe. Babwe, uh, Omawali will share remarks on their behalf. So, greetings. Thank you very Omawali. much, Sarah. First, uh, greetings to all of our panelists and solidarity with those countries who stand with solidarity around the question of self determination for the people. Uh, I come to you to share some remarks about Zimbabwe. And the first thing I want to say is that no one gave Zimbabwe their democracy or their independence. The struggle in Zimbabwe was first and foremost was a struggle to liberate their country from colonialism. But as we have known through the years that the liberation of a country politically is meaningless if it is not accompanied by the economic development and independence of its economy. And so therefore, after the liberation of Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean people set about finishing the revolution. And for the masses of people in Zimbabwe, that was to return the land to the people. And so as we sit here talking about the question of sanctions, which is a weapon of war, why has the United States and its allies targeted a small country with 14 million people, lower center of Southern Africa, with these vicious sanctions to destroy their economy and seek regime change. The one fundamental issue for the people of Zimbabwe was the return of their land. The one fundamental problem for the West was what that means for people to take their land back, to return their economy to the people. And so in 2001, the United States, feeling insulted that the Zimbabwean people dared to take their land back, and with their kith and kin in England, set about to destroy the Zimbabwean economy. And they passed a law. Hillary Clinton was very instrumental in passing of that law. It was called Zendira. And the purpose of Zendira was to immediately cut off a country that was now struggling for its development 
from all of the international trade and international finances that any developing country needs in a world economy, one that cannot exist without this international trade and access for those things that the country does not produce on its own. And so second only to Cuba, the Zimbabwean people have suffered under US and Western sanctions since 2001 to this current time right now. And in that battle, they have fought to utilize the creativity and the energy of the Zimbabwean people to resist. However, what sanctions do, it creates a crisis, a day-to-day -day crisis in the lives of people. And so Zendera was not just an economic issue, it was also a political one. How to make the Zimbabwean economy scream so that people were now looking at the question of their day-to-day -day survival and then begin to look wherever they can. So part and parcel with sanctions is the question of regime change, the question of fermenting and establishing inside countries. And all of the countries that are here today, the ones that are here and the other countries that make up over almost 40 countries that are under sanctions, understand the efforts of the West to create an opposition inside their country, an opposition financed by the West, an opposition that receives all kinds of overt and covert training with one single purpose, to seek regime change, to return land that was stolen from Africans to recolonization. And so for many people who may not be familiar in this listening and watching audience about Zimbabwe, I urge you to study the question of what's going on in Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe is leading Africa on the question of the fundamental question of the return of its land. And right now, as Zimbabwe struggles against these crushing sanctions against it in Namibia and in South Africa, in Kenya, in all of Southern Africa, the struggle is around the question of recapturing their land. So Zimbabwe is not only a situation in itself, it is also a beacon for how people on the continent will resolve the fundamental question of getting rid of not only colonialism, but neo-colonialism. And so we understand, one, that the sanctions have a tremendous effect on their ability to borrow money, their balance of payments, their ability to borrow and loan to the country so that they will be able to develop. These are all of the things and the tricks financially to undermine the currency, to devalue the currency. We also understand that in Zimbabwe, one of the fundamental questions is the question very recently that happened around crises. When we had Hurricane Ida on the west coast of southern Africa, it was a tremendous hardship and could cause tremendous damage, not only in Mozambique, but in Zimbabwe too. But without the ability to have the supplies and the trade that goes on to put in the resources of a country to be able to defend against those kinds of natural disasters, it only brings more hardship to the people. It only undermines the economy of that country. The question of COVID-19, the coronavirus, is a pandemic. Where it came from, how it will develop, and how it will resolve itself is determined by the people. But one of the things is very clear, that when anything of a crisis nation happens, those people who are for the people operate in that interest. Those people who are for an imperialist economy operate from that perspective. In Zimbabwe right now, because of the government's astute creativity and commitment to the people, as we speak right now, we only have four deaths from the coronavirus. Why? Because we're at the beginning of the pandemic hitting Africa. And those African countries who actually have had a number of years dealing with the question of pandemic sweeping across Africa were somewhat prepared but their economic systems do not buttress the healthcare systems and the healthcare systems are very fragile. So I think as Sarah said, at a time when the international community is coming together to talk about harmony, to talk about interdependence, to talk about cooperation, here is the West United, led by the United States still on its mission to undermine and seek regime change in governments whose only crime to them is a want a free and independent country for their people to develop based on how they see development should be done, determined by their people. 
And so we're very glad to be here. Um, the Zimbabweans will be back here again. You know, uh, we know last October uh, in SADC, the 14 countries of Southern Africa, there was a declaration of an international day against sanctions by all 14 countries in Southern Africa, October 25th, which launched a campaign to continue that motion around ending the sanctions. The African Union has taken a position about that. President E.D. Mnangagwa was just at the non-aligned movement through virtual, through virtual television. But in the non-aligned movement, they also voiced their concern and opposition to sanctions. Sanctions are a weapon of war, a war that we must win. And so everyone listening and participating in this webinar, it is critical for you to pay close attention to detail so that we're on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Omawali Clay, speaking for the December 12th movement on behalf of Zimbabwe. Uh, we would next like to uh, bring on Jerry Condon, a Vietnam War era veteran who organized many veterans actions against the US Contra War in Nicaragua and has participated in many solidarity delegations to Nicaragua and to other countries targeted by the US. Jerry is also the past president of Veterans for Peace. So Jerry, we call on you. Thank you. It's an honor to introduce you to Francisco O. Campbell, Nicaragua's ambassador to the United States and a longtime leader in Nicaragua's continuing struggle for freedom and independence. Ambassador Campbell was born and raised in the Afro-Caribbean community of Bluefields on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. He has been a driving force in building institutions in this autonomous region populated by indigenous peoples and the descendants of African slaves. From 1986 to 1990, Francisco Campbell served as Nicaragua's ambassador to Zimbabwe, when Zimbabwe held the position of the presidency of the non-aligned movement. He was uh, also concurrent ambassador to Tanzania, Angola, Zambia, and representative before the African National Congress in South Africa and the Southwest African People's Organization in Namibia. Between 1997 and 2010, Ambassador Campbell served as an elected Nicaraguan member to the Central American Parliament and as its vice president from 20, 2007 to 8. Ambassador Campbell is quite familiar with Washington, D.C., having served as congressional liaison in the 1980s during the U.S.-backed Contra War in Nicaragua. He has served as Nicaragua's ambassador to the United States since 2010. Please welcome Ambassador Francisco Campbell. Hello, uh, Jerry. First of all, I want to thank the organizer, organizers of this important and timely event. Likewise, my special thanks to you, Jerry, for your kind introduction. As is known, I have dealt with you for many years, more than 35 years to be exact. And I've always been impressed with your steadfast commitment and unwavering solidarity in the struggle for the right to self-determination, justice, and peace throughout the world. The topic of the panel, sanction skill, addresses those very issues. And the core purpose of the sanctions being imposed on our countries is to inflict hardship, pain, and suffering on our people to demoralize and destabilize in pursuit of the overthrow of legitimate governments like the one in Nicaragua that refused to bend to the dictates of neocolonialist ambitions. Under the leadership of President Daniel Ortega, the Nicaragua government has been implementing a policy of reconciliation and national unity. With the fight against poverty, 
its main priority. This policy, which is sustained by a strong participatory democracy, has been successful in promoting economic growth with social inclusion. And until recently, the country was registering an annual average GDP growth of 5%. The various social programs being implemented have dramatically reduced hunger and mal malnutrition in Nicaragua. Free health care throughout the country is guaranteed. Free public education has been restored. Highways integrating the countries are being built, opening new areas for agricultural production. Food security as a, is a very important topic in Nicaragua. Sectors of our society previously ignored or excluded, such as women, campesinos, and the Afrodescendant and indigenous communities of the Caribbean coast are now active and effective particip participants in the construction of a more just society that benefits the majority poor and not only the privileged few, as has been the case throughout most of our history. These accomplishments, widely recognized around the world, have meant nothing to sectors in the United States and Europe who continue to view political processes in other parts of the world through the smoky lens of ideological prejudice, ignoring the practical realities that may, may exist in individual countries. The hostility of the United States government toward the Sandinista revolution was reiterated when the George W. Bush administration in 2017 suspended bilateral relation, bilateral aid after the return to power of President Ortega, resuming the policy of systematic interventions to subvert the will of the Nicaraguan people through various forms of aggression, including financial sanctions. These sanctions whereby the United States government is using its influence in international financial institutions to block loans to Nicaragua are arbitrary and in flagrant violation of international law, including the United Nations Charter that calls for respect of national sovereignty and peaceful coexistence among states. At a time when the world is being afflicted by the deadly COVID-19 pandemic, it is imperative that these sanctions that are intended to cause suffering and destruction be elim eliminated, enabling our countries to deal with the myriad challenges to our health care systems, as well as the effects of the coronavirus on the nat national economy and the economies of the world. I would now like to briefly describe actions taken by Nicaragua to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. As soon as the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, the Nicaragua government activated the community and family public health care model that emphasizes preventive measures and community organizations. All relevant national and international protocols are being implemented. Health brigades have, been, have visited more than 4 million people in their homes to inform and create awareness of the importance of hygiene measures such as frequent washing of hands, wearing masks, social distancing, as well as taking body temperature to detect suspicious cases. Establishing monitoring and coordinated contact tracing when necessary. Similarly, 
public facilities and transportation are continuously being dis disinfected. At the same time, 19 hospitals in the country were placed on alert to deal with the, with the possible influx of COVID-19 cases and are complemented by mobile clinic units. All border posts and ports of entries are duly equipped to handle and monitor possible cases. And agreements were reached with Costa Rica in the South and Honduras in the North to protect the borders against illegal entries. At the regional level, Nicaragua, along with the other members, countries of the Central American integration system, have taken measures to facilitate and ensure the normal functioning of trade and commerce in the region and to coordinate efforts for the purchase of medical equipment and supplies necessary to deal with the pandemic. International support has also been vital to the Nicaragua strategy against COVID-19, particularly the assistance provided by Cuba, Taiwan, South Korea, among others. The indications are that like in other countries, the coronavirus will remain a challenge in Nicaragua for some time. But in this, as in other moments of difficulty, we are confident the indomitable spirit and determination of the Nicaraguan people will once again prevail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Francisco Campbell. There's really a wealth of information that we're hearing that we don't have a chance to hear. It's just blocked by the media. Uh, I, we next want to call on Baman Azad, who is an Iranian-American peace and justice activist. He's the organizational secretary of the U.S. Peace Council, a founder of the Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Military Bases, a member of Veterans for Peace, and an organizer of many solidarity delegations to countries targeted by the U.S. So, Baman, give you the floor. Uh, thank you, sir. I've been given the honor of uh, introducing Dr. Bashar Jafari, Ambassador of Syria to the United Nations. I have had the honor of working with Dr. Jafari for many years on various occasions and for various causes, and it's now an honor to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Jafari really doesn't need that much introduction. Most of us are very familiar with his fiery speeches and powerful uh, comments at the United Nations and especially at the Security Council in defense of the rights of the Syrian people, its sovereignty, the country's sovereignty and national determination and independence. Dr. Jafari has been very cr critical in exposing the hypocrisy of the U.S. government in its claim of supporting democracy, human rights, and international law. Syria has been under attack since 2011, at least. And with the help of US mercenaries, the Islamic State, terrorists, and few other US mercenary forces, Syria has been suffering from a lot of mass killings by these people, by these criminals. And now it is being occupied, some of some parts of its territory, by the United States and its allies, by Israeli government, and recently by Turkey. So the question of the struggle for maintaining and safeguarding the integrity, territorial integrity of Syria, protecting its independence and sovereignty is an issue for all of us. I am honored to introduce to you Dr. Bashar Jafari. Thank you so much, dear friend, uh, Dr. Baman, uh, for uh, inviting me to participate at this very noble and lofty uh, webinar. I'm very glad to see these uh, lovely faces uh, of uh, friends that I haven't seen for a while, but uh, I have you all in my heart. 
Uh, dear colleagues, uh, allow me to thank you for holding this important uh, meeting and for dedicating this time to us. Even though it is a weekend and despite the circumstances we all live in due to the outbreak of this unexpected virus. Although, as you know, we are suffering from too many viruses. Uh, some of them are human, some of them are not. We deep appreciate the initiative of the US Peace Council to launch the petition of the open letter to stop economic sanctions and all other initiatives that aim to work for collective actions to oppose regime change efforts in targeted countries through military intervention and sanctions imposition. You have said it, it's about 39 countries out of 193 countries, which is the total number of member states at the United Nations, meaning that almost one fifth of the humanity are suffering from sanctions. This is too much. We are all facing an extraordinary circumstance and going through a critical time in which our world trying to deal and contain the spread of COVID-19, which requires real synergy of the efforts of all governments without exception and unification of international regional and national measures for prevention and treatment. However, the countries which suffer from the severe negative impact of the unilateral coercive economic measures deal with additional pressure and challenges of a different type in the face of this pandemic. In addition to that, the sustained negative effects of these illegal measures on the welfare of citizens, their daily lives, and their ability to enjoy basic health and education services. The current crisis situation linked to the spread of this dangerous virus poses new and unprecedented challenges to the Syrian government, foremost of which are the following. First, Providing basic infrastructure and necessary ingredients for the health sectors in order to provide prevention, checks, and treatment for all without exception. Second, providing basic medical, nutritional, and service materials to everyone without exception. Third, empowering the Syrian economy in a way that gives the government and the public and private sectors the ability to support and finance the necessary plans and procedures to ensure the containment of the spread of this virus, especially in fields of sterilization, isolation, and closing public and private places and facilities. Unilateral coercive measures directly affect the ability of the main economic sectors in Syria to perform their tasks effectively, especially in the fields of energy, banking, health, industry, transportation, communications, internal and external trade, adjust the local currency rate, and combating high prices of all basic materials and services, etc., etc. I would like to point out, point out here that these punitive and unlawful measures and allow me to underline these two very important words, unlawful, punitive, and unlawful measures, because according to the UN Charter, what is called sanctions are unlawful and illegal and illegitimate. The UN does not recognize any regime of sanctions the only legitimate sanctions recognized by the UN member states are the ones imposed by the Security Council, only the Security Council. And none of these 39 countries 
suffering from European and economic sanctions, none of them has been, I mean, none of them has, be, has suffered sanctions endorsed by the Security Council. So all these sanctions are illegitimate, punitive, and unlawful. I reiterate, I would like to point out here that these punitive and unlawful measures continue to cause a weakening of the ability of the public and private medical sector in Syria to import medicines and medical materials due to the tight targeting of these unilateral coercive measures to the Syrian banking sector, especially in the field of foreign bank transfer. Moreover, many companies specialized in the medical and pharmaceutical industries refrain from dealing or contracting with the public and private sectors in Syria, fearing that they would be targeted with financial, banking, and commercial sanctions imposed by the US government or any third party that it considered had violated the US economic blockade imposed on the Syrian Arab Republic. The US government imposes a wide series of coercive unilateral economic measures on the Syrian Arab Republic. And in reference to the recent fact sheets and press releases regarding exemptions, exceptions, and authorizations for humanitarian assistance and the trade from the US Office of Foreign Assets Control, known as OFAC. These so-called exemptions granted by the US Treasury Department were and are still subject to politicized considerations that lead to the delivery of this aid to areas that are controlled by terrorist armed groups, which in turn take over this aid and prevent it from reaching its true beneficiaries with the aim of supporting the position of these terrorist groups, prolonging the war and obstructing the prospects for a final and comprehensive settlement. This paragraph is very important, as you see, because it explains to everybody that these um, uh, State Department uh, claims that the American administration does not uh, uh, impose or does not uh, prevent the uh, exportation of humanitarian assistance to, to Syria is wrong. It is not correct. They, the, state, the American administration allows only sending so-called humanitarian assistance with weaponry, of course, and mercenaries and money coming from the Gulf states only to the terrorist groups in the northwest and northeast of Syria. Moreover, the Central Bank of Syria was also unable to take advantage of the Syrian funds frozen abroad. Our own funds, by the way. Syrian funds. They are frozen abroad with the aim of financing the materials that are related to the basic needs of the Syrian people. As the international or foreign banks did not respond to the payment orders issued by the central bank. And the Syrian parties did not get any response to the communications, neither through the banking correspondence system or through diplomatic channels. We highly appreciate your dedication to the cause of lifting the unilateral sanctions imposed on the peoples of 39 countries. And we invite you to pay special attention to the conditions of Palestinian citizens under Israeli occupation and the Syrian citizens in the, in the Syrian occupied Golan who are deprived of their rights to sufficient medical and health care. So as you see, we are suffering from too many types of terrorism. The latest type introduced by those who impose sanctions on, on 39 countries is what we call the health terrorism. They already imposed political terrorism, they already, already imposed economic terrorism, and now they are imposing health terrorism. Of course, we add to this uh, financial terrorism, and educational one, and uh, media terrorism. In conclusion, the government of Syria 
confirms that it has mobilized all its human, medical, and nutritional resources available to serve all Syrians, wherever they are in the face of this global COVID-19 pandemic. Syria also highly appreciates the positions and statements made by the Secretary General of the United Nations recently, in which he called for an end to unilateral coercive measures imposed on many peoples of the world, including the Syrian people. Allow me here to open brackets to explain to you a little bit what's going on right now in the United Nations. Since the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, uh, announced twice on the 23rd and 27th of, la of uh, March. Uh, he announced twice, actually, uh, uh, the necessity to lift the uh, economic sanctions imposed on uh, the country's victims of this immoral system. Twice he did it. And since these two calls uh, happened, we saw at the United Nations, the General Assembly precisely, to be uh, precise, we saw several initiatives, several uh, draft resolutions or statements submitted by dozens of member states. Of course, all of them are infiltrated by Western European uh, uh, countries or by the uh, American uh, delegation. These Dozens of statements and the draft resolutions, all of them lacked any reference to the necessity of ending the economic unilateral coercive measures. Although the Secretary General was very clear in his uh, two calls on the 23rd and 27th of March, or of April, sorry, uh, with regard to the necessity of lifting the uh, sanctions in order to uh, enable uh, those who are victims of these sanctions to uh, confront the uh, pandemic. The Syrian government affir affirms that any collective and global effort to combat and eliminate the spread of this dangerous virus cannot achieve the desired results in light of the continuing policy of imposing economic blockade by some governments, led by the United States of America, of course on more than 2 billion people in the world. 2 billion people are suffering from economic sanctions, including China, of course, and Russia. Let me just conclude by telling you an unfortunate incident, incident that took place today. And it shows how those who impose sanctions on the Syrian people have abandoned humanitarian considerations and have become prisoners of political obsession by punishing those who don't go along with their policies. Today, Saturday, the European Union decided to reject the request of the Syrian government to send aircraft to return the Syrian expatriates in some European Union countries who wish to return to Syria in light of this global pandemic. The reason is the unilateral sanctions policy imposed also on the Syrian people, on the, on the Syrian air transport sector. Needless to say that the Europeans will not provide an alternative solution, and those Syrians may remain stuck there, unable to return to their country. So where is the humanitarian concerns of this phony West? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bashar Jafari. And this is an important term that you have brought into the discussion, health terrorism, along with military, economic, financial terrorism. We, and we're gonna come back to this in our Q&A. Uh, the next one to bring up Terry Matson, who is uh, with the Latin America Campaign Coordinator for Code Pink. She's led anti-sanctions campaign delegation to Venezuela, spent three months there, is the founder and program manager for the Intrepid News Fund and the co-founder of the campaign to end US and Canada sanctions against Venezuela. She recently returned from a three week visit to uh, Cuba and Venezuela. So Terry, we give it to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. 
It's really an honor to um, be here this afternoon um, on behalf of Code Pink and on behalf of introducing uh, Mr. Carlos Ron from Venezuela. I'm really pleased um, that all of us were able to put this project together, or all of the um, solidarity coalitions, as well as all of you um, who so graciously accepted the invitation to attend this webinar. So this afternoon, I have the honor of introducing a wonderful person who has represented Venezuela for probably most of his life. Carlos Ron is currently the Vice Minister of North America of the People's Power Ministry of Foreign Relations. Carlos's life's work has been with the creation and continued development of the Bolivarian Project. All of this against 20 years of U.S. efforts to force regime change in Venezuela. Regime change beginning in 1999 with the election of Hugo Chavez, uh, regime change in the form of a media coup, and later escalating into uh, U.S. unilateral sanctions against Venezuela beginning in December of 2014. And then in May of 2019, we saw the U.S. government seize the Venezuelan embassy here in Washington, D.C. And all of that, Carlos has seen. And he most recently, most of you would probably uh, recognize his face in Washington, D.C. He served for many years as the charge de affairs in Washington at the Venezuelan embassy. He served in that position until May of 2018, um, after the re democratic re-election of Nicolas Maduro in May of 2018, Carlos returned to Caracas. And his witness is where he is joining us from today. And he does serve as vice minister of the foreign um, ministry. We are extraordinarily fortunate to have him join us today on the heels of the May 3rd uh, mercenary um, incursion in Venezuela, the failed incursion that attempted to overthrow democratically elected President Nicolas Maduro. So Carlos, thank you so much for your time today. And it's a real honor to be able to um, introduce you this afternoon and have you join all of us. Well, thank you, Terry, and, and uh, for your kind words. And thank you all for, for putting this together. Um, also to uh, the colleagues that, that, that are joining us. Um, I, I thank you as well for, for this effort because it is important that, that we as countries are undergoing uh, this violent aggression uh, from the United States that we are able to all uh, join together and defend uh, multilateralism, defend uh, the Charter of the United Nations and, and, and defend diplomacy over all forms of, uh, uh, against all forms of aggression. Um, very briefly, because I know we, we, are, we have a lot of guests and, and, and a lot of topics to cover. Um, Venezuela has been under U.S. Uh, unilateral coercive measures, as they, uh, they should be called and not, and not sanctions, um, uh, under, you know, since about 2006, when uh, we first started with some uh, prohibitions on uh, military equipment and, and, and of the sort. But we have also uh, had a, a spike, I would say, of this um, uh, of these aggressions starting on uh, the year 2014 with uh, some legislation approved in Congress that led to a 2015 uh, executive order by President Obama, where uh, Venezuela was declared uh, an unusual and extraordinary threat to the uh, foreign policy and the. Uh, and of, of the United States and, and the national security of the United States. Um, after this, uh, they first started with, with some uh, uh, members of, uh, of the government being uh, sanctioned with uh, my name play, being placed on list. And of course, uh, the rhetoric of the United States is that this is only targeting uh, these individuals, but it doesn't have any effect, which is not true because as we all know, once you uh, have somebody in a high position or in a crucial position for a country, uh, be it president, be it the president of its national bank, uh, you know, you, these people, people that do contracts, that have business, that have interactions of any sort, 
um, would, you know, also would feel that they cannot do so because they're going to be uh, somehow reprimanded by uh, U.S. government. And it starts affecting the nation itself. Um, with the coming of President Trump, then we saw uh, um, tougher uh, measures against Venezuela. Uh, we right now, and, and you know, for time's sake, I'm not going to go over every uh, every one of the uh, sanctions that have been issued. But we have prohibition of uh, import and export of oil, which is our main industry, and that you know in itself is is something uh, key f uh, for Venezuelan economy. It's our main source of income. Um, but we've also had, uh, uh, you know, the measures taking that, that entail a financial blockade. You know, we have money over $9 billion um, uh, that have been blocked in banks that are in accounts in the United States and elsewhere that the financial system from the United States gets access to that are not, uh, that we're not able to manage or, or to use. And, you know, not only the executive orders from the Obama or Trump administration are the ones that, that hurt, but there are other things that, that cause as much damage. And, you know, there's an advisory uh, issued by FinCEN from, from the uh, Treasury Department to the financial system, basically saying, uh, this was September 2017, basically saying any, any money that uh, comes from the state of Venezuela or of the government agencies in Venezuela may be uh, construed as uh, money that was uh, involved in drug trafficking or was involved in some illegal activity. And with that said, that means that anything, anything that is uh, basically that we attempt to pay any transaction uh, that we try to do uh, somehow gets blocked. So the rhetoric by the State Department and by Treasury and by the U.S. government is, well, you know, uh, this is not true because we have uh, issued licenses where um, the, the money, if, if they're going to make a food purchase, it's not going to be blocked. If they're going to make a, a purchase of, uh, for medicine, it's not going to be blocked. This is not true um, because once you're going to make a payment, regardless of what type of payment you are going to um, uh, to do, I mean, the bank is a transaction is what being, is being blocked in itself. So whenever you try to, whether you're trying to buy a, a table or whether you're trying to buy, you know, a, a pound of rice, in either case, the transaction itself is blocked. And this is very important because we have to we have to break down this uh, this myth that uh, what they do doesn't affect uh, people. As a matter of fact, it was interesting because it, they know that this, is, this goes on and, and they know it because uh, their own members of Congress, uh, recently there was a letter issued uh, a couple of weeks ago by 11 senators where they say, they, they tell the administration precisely because of COVID-19 that they should uh, uh, lift uh, the sanctions on Iran and Venezuela in this particular letter, and they and there is a passage which I'm, I'm going to read to you because I think it's very important that it shows exactly the level of hypocrisy in the official message comes from the United States. It says the letter says we understand that the administration has stated that humanitarian and medical needs are exempt from U.S. sanctions, but our sanctions regime is so broad that medical suppliers and relief organizations simply steer clear of doing business in Iran and in Venezuela in fear of accidentally getting caught up in U.S. sanctions web. See, these are lawmakers from the United States who are saying this. This is not myself. This is not my government. This is not any of our colleagues here. It's lawmakers from the United States. Yesterday, there was a bill introduced in Congress uh, also where addressing the issues of COVID-19, where they actually says as well that they want to make sure that the U.S. institutions know that they should ease or they should allow, they should make sure everybody knows that any purchases dealing with uh, health or, or, um, or food or in this time period should not be blocked. So if they have to say it, if they have to bind the administration by law, uh, it, by, you know, it, in order for that to be carried out, it is because it's a problem. It is because they know and they understand that this is not something that uh, this is, you know, th this 
not a, a flow of medicine and food that enters the country without being somehow subjected to problems. And I'm not saying it's just food and and medicine because those are the primary things that we think about. But you know, they are, there's a sabotage on the Venezuelan oil sector. There's a sabotage on spare parts for industry, and all these things add up to making this particular situation of COVID-19 a very serious one. You know, we have to we have to denounce this because there is a near contradiction in the rhetoric. Because every time we, all of our countries are, are somehow accused and, and or the justification that is used in order to say that these sanctions are legal or, or that, or that they, they have the right to apply these sanctions, uh, often include the human rights discourse. And there's a political misuse, um, ill-intentioned use of something as serious as human rights. And it's a contradiction because the same people that are denouncing us for human rights are committing a savage violation of human rights on all of our populations because they're subjecting them to the hardships that entail this, uh, this, uh, these sanctions and these blockades. We're currently, we have presented before the, um, the International Criminal Court uh, a case where we're bringing, you know, we're trying to, uh, for the court to recognize that these people in charge of uh, the policy towards Venezuela are committing acts of collective punishment and it is an act of extermination against the Venezuelan people. So, that being said, why, how are we dealing with this? And I tell you, it, it, we, we, we know the purpose of these measures are uh, undoubtedly regime change. And Venezuela, on, right now, you know, uh, perhaps in the last uh, couple of weeks, we have, we have felt the most intensive advance from the Trump administration against us uh, in, in this uh, manner. Uh, we had indictments against our, our, our officials. We had a, a transition plan, which is basically a capitulation that they want to, uh, to want us to uh, subject to. They have, they have launched a military operation, which is the largest military operation in the region in the last 30 years, in order to supposedly combat uh, uh, um, narco traffic or uh, drug trafficking in, in our region. But it is all aimed at the same thing of building greater pressure against us in the time of COVID-19, because they, the purpose precisely is that we have both the pressure of the sanctions and uh, the pressure of, of the disease uh, somehow affecting and leading to uh, uh, the change of government that they want. The reality is, the reality is this, we, this is a tough uh, situation with COVID-19 because suppliers don't wish to sell because they're afraid of what would happen. Because if those that wish to sell, the, they agree to sell, they'll charge two or three times the price that we need to pay. And because pain, like I said, has always been a challenge. Let me tell you something too. We, when this situation began with COVID-19, we went to, uh, we communicated to US authorities that this was uh, a hardship and that if, you know, that if, if, it was, if it was true that they would allow uh, um, the basic uh, items to be purchased, you know, we gave them the numbers of accounts. We gave them the needs that we had. We, we showed them, you know, this is the order. This is what we're buying, masks, uh, uh, tools. They said, not really of yours uh, to the side because you're, you're not the legitimate government of Venezuela. White dollar represents the legitimate government. So it's back to their own Again, it's one more time back to the own regime change operation. We've done, we've, against this uh, virus of unilateralism and of art, you know, arbitrary actions, um, you know, by using the, let's use the, 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 the common phrases of the, of the time, I think we have the vaccines of multilateralism and solidarity. We have worked with Cuba, with our brothers and sisters of Cuba, of China, of Russia, who have been, who have shown extreme solidarity to Venezuela. We had the Henry Reeve uh, delegation from Cuba come in to Venezuela, where uh, they have helped us uh, uh, follow to and, and, and you know, visit uh, our population and, and make sure that they are tested. We have received donations of uh, equipment from China and, and from Russia, just, uh, just you know, last night we had an arrival of, uh, of uh, vials for of insulin that are 
that are needed. Of, uh, we've received over 30,000 tests from Russia. China has helped as well with tests and has helped with a brigade of experts that came to Venezuela also uh, so to help us deal with this uh, pandemic. And we have had uh, also the, the support of the World Health Organization and, and we're working together with them in order to address this. Venezuela today is the country in the region that has carried out the most number of tests. We are um, on the, around 507,000 tests and we have, which is about a, a percentage of 16,900 uh, per million inhabitants. Um, and we carried out with one of our systems, a uh, uh, network of uh, social programs, the Patria system, we have carried out uh, uh, surveys in order to identify where people with a high risk are and where we can um, uh, reach out to them and test them and make sure that we can contain the spread. Over 19 million people have uh, responded to this. Uh, we have made of over 201,000 uh, visits to homes to make sure that, that, that we help contain this. And we have um, also, we have a team of over 1100, uh, I'm sorry, 11,000 doctors working at this, uh, in this case. So this is, the, this is a response that is also, which is very important to say, this is also accompanied by popular organization, by our, our communes, by our grassroots organizations that through all these years of aggression of the United States, they have perfected their uh, the you know community work uh, alliances and and just the you know the caring for each other and it has been key and instrumental because the the way we have uh, our community doctors and the way we have uh, the community uh, helping each other with food with uh, distributing uh, uh, information about how to prevent uh, this uh, disease has been key has been a key response to the Venezuelan people in the midst of this aggression. This aggression. Again, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for taking uh, so much time, but I think this, these are uh, uh, very passionate um, um, issues that we have to uh, address. And I thank you again for the solidarity that you've always had uh, with the people of Venezuela, with uh, President Maduro, and with all of us at the Bolivarian government. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos Ron Martinez, especially in explaining just how calculated and sinister the sanctions are combined with the U.S. military plans. Seeing the whole picture, so important. We next uh, want to bring on Margaret Flowers. Margaret is a co-director of Popular Resistance, co-host of the radio program Clearing the Fog, and a member of the Embassy Protection Collective, still facing charges for the courageous defense of the Venezuelan embassy. Margaret is a medical doctor, a pediatrician. So thank you, Margaret. For coming thank through. you, Sarah. Can you see me now? Let's see. They're yeah. Coming up. Yeah. Okay, you are. great. Um, thank you. It's really an honor to be able to introduce to you Dr. Majid Takht Ravanshi, who is currently the permanent representative of Iran to the United Nations. I had the honor to visit Iran in February of 2019 on a peace delegation organized by Code Pink. Dr. Ravanshi served as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Political Affairs in the Office of the President beginning in 2017. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Foreign Minister for European and American Affairs from 2013 to 2017. Going backward, he was the Deputy Director for, of the Encyclopedia of Contemporary Islam between 2009 and 2013. Then he was an advisor to the Foreign Minister from 2006 to 2009, Ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein before that, and before that, Special Advisor to the Foreign Minister from 1998 to 2002. Dr. Ravanshi also served as the United Nation, at the United Nations in New York from 1992 to 1998 with the rank of ambassador, holding the position of deputy permanent representative and counselor. Uh, Dr. Ravanshi holds a doctorate in political science from the University of Bern, Switzerland, and a master's degree in inter international political economy and development from Fordham University in the United States 
He has also earned a master's and bachelor degrees in civil engineering from the Univers University of Kansas, which is all, also in the United States. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Um, Ajit Takht Ravanchi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flowers, for the introduction. Uh, very glad to be here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to address this important international webinar, which is organized by altruist people who I wholeheartedly thank for their uh, very valuable campaign to enhance the awareness of world public opinion on the need to fight COVID-19 without any hindrance. Representing a country whose people have seriously suffered as a result of over four decades of inhumane sanctions, today I will focus on the impacts of the current US sanctions on Iran, particularly our capacity to fight COVID-19 and to address its vast socioeconomic consequences. In our common fight against COVID-19, all of humanity is on the same front. And to succeed quickly and sustainably, we must ensure that no community or nation is left alone and behind. Therefore, any act restricting the ability of nations to tackle this crisis would help the disease spread like wildfire, consequently weakening the global fight against the pandemic. A clear example in this regard is the continued application of unilateral sanctions against us, which undermine our front from within in favor of the disease and function exactly like the enemy's fifth column. Now let me briefly explain how sanctions inhibit Iran's ability to fight COVID-19. While Iran is experiencing one of the worst outbreaks of the coronavirus, the US sanctions, which according to its officials, are the most extensive sanctions ever imposed on a country, are drastically hindering Iran's efforts to treat patients and effectively prevent the spread of the virus. This is despite the fact that Iran's medical facilities, doctors and nurses are among the very finest in the world and the professional nature of our national efforts to suppress COVID-19 is highly acknowledged by the WHO. To escape from the disgrace of the illegal and immoral nature of, the, of sanctions, the US officials continue to claim that humanitarian and medical needs are exempt from sanctions, but they are not. On February 27, 2020, the US Treasury finalized with, with much fanfare the Swiss humanitarian trade arrangement, Swiss Channel, allowing certain humanitarian transactions with Iran. However, this narrow channel does not match Iran's humanitarian needs in the current situation. At the same time, the United States has forced this Swiss channel to pursue a very tight and tough procedure under pretexts like ensuring the utmost transparency or enhanced due diligence, requiring companies to provide extensive information to the Treasury Department every month on the Iranian beneficiaries of the goods, the Iranian company's business relationship and financial details and the like, thus making it practically very difficult for companies to trade with Iran. Additionally, the almost impossible or cumbersome nature of transferring Iran's reserves blocked outside the country to the designated Swiss bank, not only does not allow the Swiss channel to function properly now, but may actually render it redundant in a matter of few months. Likewise, recently several companies that supply the medicine and medical equipment required to fight the coronavirus have stopped shipping to Iran because the current US sanctions regime makes the shipping of such items to Iran almost impossible. Moreover, the only message of the US's additional new sanctions imposed in the midst of the outbreak is that companies must avoid doing any business with Iran, even their 
world is humanitarian in nature. In short, the U.S. sanctions regime, including the relevant penalties, is extremely broad and has created a company, a compliance minefield for the legal trade with Iran and consequently medical supplies and relief organizations simply steer clear of doing business in Iran in the fear of accidentally getting caught up in the U.S. sanctions web. From the start of COVID-19 outbreak, we have received valuable emergency aid from some countries as well as from the WHO and certain humanitarian organizations. Nevertheless, for a vast country like Iran, with a population of nearly 83 million, which is among the worst impacted countries by COVID-19, such emergency aid is not the panacea. Accordingly, due to the vast impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on almost all aspects of life in the affected societies, neither Iran nor any other country can rely only on emergency aids. Hence, the immediate removal of all sanctions on banking, insurance, transportation, medical, industry, energy, exports, imports and the like is a must as it would enable the targeted countries to use freely and fully their own resources to effectively suppress the pandemic and address its short and long-term impacts. This is what the international community is calling for, the living example of which is this webinar, as well as other sim similar efforts of civil society in different corners of the world. As you might be well aware, such a strong and repeated calls have recently been made also by the United Nations Secretary General, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, a, a number of UN human rights reporters, some other international dignitaries, as well as many former and current statesmen and stateswomen, parliamentarians, including in the US, religious leaders and academia. Likewise, at the world stage, such important political groupings like the Group of 77 and China, with more than 130 member states, as well as a 120 member states of the non-aligned movement, including, including in its recent virtual summit on COVID-19, have joined the international calls for the removal of sanctions. To, to conclude, I would like to once again thank the organizers of this webinar and recognize the value of your, of your efforts. Indeed, nothing is more humanistic than confronting such immoral and inhumane policies like weaponizing medicine and food in these trying times. I thank you very much for your, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Vanchi. I very much appreciate uh, your comments here today. Uh, every one of these uh, speakers really provides such a wealth of information, and we will provide this in text, in radio, in uh, video formats in the days ahead because it's just invaluable and it is what is broken, taken away from the movement. Uh, before a second round of questions, and we do hope these busy diplomats can <laughs> stay with us for a few more minutes, uh, we want to take time for a couple of announcements uh, and also to say to everyone that we will be back in three weeks uh, with attention on other countries strangled by Wall Street and the banks based on U.S. regulations, particular attention on Palestine and a whole number of other countries along with these sanctioned countries. But right now, we want to take a minute before Q&A to draw attention to what else you can do. And we want to bring back uh, Bahman Azad for that and to also uh, call on Emily Thomas, who is uh, with IFCO Pastors for Peace, a longtime activist who has uh, traveled to Cuba uh, and been so much a part. As she said, um, she's so glad that a little thing right, like retirement hasn't kept her from doing what she can to make a better world possible. So for both Bauman Azad and for Emily Thomas, uh, let's take a, just an announcement and then we'll uh, have time also for the Q&A. So thank Bauman, you, Sarah. Please. Thank you. Well, uh, people have heard by now 
if they hadn't before, the crimes against humanity that is being committed by the United States government against the people of the world in every corner. And this has been going on for a long time, but it seems that it's intensifying right now. The US government is using the, the COVID-19 pandemic as a kind of a smoke screen to intensify the attack and the regime change policies on some of these countries. We know that about Venezuela with those incursions that happened, the dispatch of deployment of US warships to the shores of Venezuela. We know US is reinforcing again its forces in Iraq, threatening Iran left and right, as we know that. And given all that, it, at the same time, it is election times in the United States. And we know that sometimes prior to the elections, some incumbent presidents are willing to take some extreme measures to get themselves elected. So all of these point to the fact that we are dealing with an emergency on our hand and we need to deal with it and be prepared for it. So there are ongoing events, activities that are um, on our agenda and we invite all of you to participate in. One is the International Week of uh, Anti-Imperialist Action that we had scheduled for um, May 25th, which is the African Liberation Day and goes to, the, uh, to May 31st. Uh, the second is uh, a webinar that Sarah mentioned briefly. We are shooting to have a second webinar with the participation of the People's Movement representatives on March 31st, uh, hopefully. We are organizing that. There is an ongoing letter, open letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations and the President of the United States that is collecting signatures and letters are being sent demanding that US military actions be stopped during this crisis period and forever and also sanctions be lifted. Um, you can go to uspeacecouncil.org, the petition is there, but also on UNAC site, Sanction Skill site, and many other organizations, they have a link to that petition and letter. You can sign, please do that. So far, we have signed, uh, collected over 8,200 signatures. We want to shoot, we are shooting for at least 10,000, so we need your support for that. And finally, we are coming up with a pledge, pledge on the part of the people in the United States to commit themselves to be vigilant and be ready to take action if something crazy starts happening again, as it did last week. So we are asking you to sign on Sanctions Kill webpage. I hope we can put it on the website right now. Um, the commitment to be willing to get on a list for action alerts if something needs to be done quickly. Uh, I will, I'm going to ask uh, Emily to read the content of that uh, pledge for you, and I encourage you to please make sure you sign that pledge. Thank you. Thank you, Bauman, and thank you, everyone. Um, the pledge, as Bauman said, is something that each of us can do and we can share with other people in our neighbors, our friends, our family, and our faith communities, and um, to have a large number of people ready to respond. Um, we know that the Trump administration has used COVID-19 to intensify their regime change effects on the targeted countries. We've seen military invention, intervention. We've seen increased sanctions enforcement. The pledge. I am opposed to military action, mercenary armies, and the continued economic sanctions on the 39 countries by the US. I pledge to work for collective action to oppose these threats. Please add my name for emergency response. Sign it, join us all together. 
and we shall overcome. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Uh, we we next uh, and and just to say that we will be back uh, in three weeks. We want to take some more uh, questions uh, from our speakers, from our excellent panelists. Before we do, uh, just a word of introduction on one of the tireless webmasters of Sanctions Kill, Jim Wallace, a, a labor activist, now a retired school teacher, and the thousands of signers, a wealth of information of the whole anti-sanctions movement is on the Sanctions Kill site, thanks to the work of Jim. That means every organization that is working against sanctions, we're trying to put links on this site so we can cooperate and collaborate together. So uh, Jim Wallace, thank you. And just if you describe a bit about the page. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Thanks ever so much. Margaret Flowers is also uh, an important webmaster. Um, hopefully, if you haven't, you will go to sanctionskill.org. One of the exciting aspects of the Sanctions Kill effort is the principled um, non-sectarian collaboration of so many groups, many of whom have already been mentioned already and who are listed among the initial endorsement endorsers on the endorsers page. There's also an incredible list of other organizational endorsers from all around the world. And quite honestly, uh, we got so many thousands of individual endorsers, we just couldn't keep up with them all. So that's very dated. On From the Sanctions Kill, you can get uh, the translation in many languages. You um, can get a resource page which um, has an incredible amount of uh, information, a special COVID-19 and sanctions section, and a new uh, place to sign the pledge. Uh, we want to encourage creativity for the May 25th to 31st International Week of Actions Against U.S. Imposed Sanctions and Economic War. Please be sure to add any sanctions-related efforts for the ongoing actions page that you are doing, whether in general against sanctions or related to a specific country, send to info at sanctionskill.org. Solidarity to all, stay well and power to the people. Thank you, Jim. And now we, we wanna bring uh, each of our uh, are the representatives who spoke for a round of, of questions. Uh, I think we'll have to do this by uh, raising hands uh, or, or just jump in, uh, turn, on, turn on your sound and your video. Uh, but one of the th questions that we had is how can greater solidarity and exchange help you in the campaign at the UN to end the sanctions and in the international campaigns to end the sanctions. Another question that has popped up again and again, and you can address either or you may want to have comment on another aspect that has happened in the discussion. But it is that with all essential equipment and medicines in such short supply, especially due to sanctions, how uh, your country is able to cope with this global pandemic, how people's mobilizations are helping uh, in some way to grapple with this fierce problem. So either, either question or your own comments are very welcome at this time. And, and thank you to everyone who's been participating so far. I'm, we we could do it in the order uh, at which we were speaking uh, originally, which I think we would go to Ambassador Ana Silva Rodriguez if she is available to come on. Uh, I'm not. We don't have a, an official way of uh, coping at this time with. Uh, how we'll handle the Q&A, and I do hope that uh, 
you know, our representatives will jump in. Oh, thank you. So, so sorry, I have to jump from the bathroom. So could you, could you repeat your question again? I just uh, saw the last, yes. the last part. Yes, it is how, how can greater solidarity and exchange help you in the campaign at the UN and in other international forums to end the sanctions? And also that with so much essential equipment and medicine blocked, uh, how you're able to cope, and in the case of Cuba, certainly help other countries to cope with this global pandemic. Of course, solidarity is essential in our campaign, you know, not, not yeah. only in favor of Cuba, but all the countries that suffer from uh, uh, economic coercive measures that suffer from Sancho. Solidarity, we need the solidarity to continue pushing the governments who are imposing sanctions to us in order to change the policy. Because of the solidarity, Cuba have this uh, great support all over the world against uh, his uh, battle against the blockade. So I think that without you, and, and, and now I avail this opportunity again to thank all the solidarity movement uh, in, uh, of, in favor of Cuba for the long-standing position uh, supporting the Cuban revolution, supporting the Cuban battle for your own way in a, a position. Regarding the, the needs, of course, uh, uh, the, the impact of the, the sanction, I am imagining that for all of us that suffer sanction, and in order to cope with the COVID, half, half, uh, we are uh, having, uh, has an effect in, in Cuba uh, with a uh, mass, with uh, uh, rapid kits to test, with disposable uh, protection for the, the personal that is in the, working in the hospital, uh, but also we are trying to manage and, and thanks again to other countries that are helping us. Uh, we receive donation from China, from Russia. Sometimes donation cannot arrive to Cuba because of the a, a blockade to Cuba. For example, a big donation for Alibaba Foundation that they are uh, donated ventilators, rapid kits, Mass and could not arrive to Cuba because of the carrier uh, at the very last moment said that they are going, they are receiving pressure for the US government that they are going to receive sanctions so that they, they cannot send this donation to Cuba. Um, but mainly these are the, the, the things that, that are most uh, needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I. I don't know if uh, Ambassador Francisco Campbell would like to jump in or if there's someone else who's coming on. Ah, Ambassador Banshi from Iran. Yes, that's calling you. Uh, you have to unmute though. Yes, yes, I just did. Ah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, uh, for your first question, I think what is important is to uh, raise awareness uh, in different parts of the world that uh, this pandemic or other uh, problems that the whole humanity faces, like in, in environmental degradation. Uh, you can name uh, a lot of questions these days, a uh, lot of issues that do not recognize borders. Uh, pandemics, uh, like the one that we are uh, dealing with uh, these days, uh, COVID-19, does not recognize uh, borders. Uh, uh, it cannot be said that it stops at, at the U.S. border and it, it can enter the Iranian border. Therefore, the awareness uh, at the uh, international level, world level, uh, to uh, inform the public opinion that the whole humanity, the whole world, uh, are at the in, in the same boat. Uh, if we do not uh, consider this fact, which is a very simple fact, we cannot be in a position to, to defeat uh, uh, and contain this virus. Unfortunately, uh, when the application of these unjust and illegal sanctions uh, are, are continuing against uh, several countries, this means that this simple reality is not being understood. So what is important is for everybody to do whatever it takes, whatever uh, he or she can to uh, increase the awareness that, that uh, it is not a, a political tool. 
in the hands of uh, certain countries to, uh, to use uh, against other countries. What is important at this juncture is for every country to put whatever they have as capacities together to, to, to contain this virus and to, uh, to get rid of it. And the best thing that can be done is to uh, move away from sanctions, move, move away from, from hatred. Uh, that unfortunately has been going on for uh, some centuries against some, some countries, and then work together. Because as I said, we are in the same boat, either we will win together or we will lose together. And uh, common sense tells us that, that it's better to work towards winning such a fight. As I said, this pandemic is not the only problem that we are facing today. Environmental degradation is, is, is more or less the same problem that the humanity faces. And we have to bring all the forces uh, available uh, to uh, every country together so, so that we can, we can overcome uh, these difficulties. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so very much. Uh, let me see if there's, ah, Ambassador Francisco Campbell. Yes, I see you. your screen on, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think what you are doing in promoting uh, uh, awareness and the importance of the American people uh, expressing their firm solidarity with peoples around the world who are suffering from the effects of uh, the sanctions. I think it's very, very commendable and I encourage you to continue with this kind of work. Our responsibility of course, is to keep you fully informed, and we intend to do so. As Jerry pointed out in the 1980s, I was here in Washington, and uh, we were able to work together with the peoples of the United States, the various solidarity group that, in, in effect, got Congress to assume a strong position against the the, uh, the uh, Reagan administration uh, counter-revolutionary war against Nicaragua. That was a very, very uh, successful effort and we are convinced that it helped to avoid greater war in, in, in Central America. With regards to the pandemic, Nicaragua is absolutely convinced that the international community must come together, must work together very closely in, in combating this pandemic that is doing so much harm to all of us. It is not the time for unilateral aggressive action against country, but rather it is time that together in a strong spirit of solidarity, we work to, to combat what is the common enemy of mankind, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Ambassador Campbell. Uh, ask one of our next panelists to jump in. Uh, or uh, Omawale Clay, who is speaking for uh, Zimbabwe today also can uh, jump in. All right. I hello. You know, yeah, I would just I would just comment that. Can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, but turn on your can screen. You okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah. I would just I would just simply add that the effort at solidarity that the Sanctions Kill campaign is undertaking is very instrumental in first educating people truthfully about what's going on. I think we cannot overemphasize the fact that here, particularly in the United States, there's a role for all of us to play, particularly in reaching out and putting pressure on our legislators to understand what's happening with these countries in terms of the role of the sanctions. One of the things that I think people have pointed out that this uh, sanctions 
campaign responsibilities is to let people know that when the United States says they're targeting individuals and that the sanctions are not really harming the people of the country, this pandemic is an excellent example of by targeting the country, it denies that country access to many of the trading relationships to get the supplies, chemicals, medicines that are absolutely needed. Uh, we saw that historically in Zimbabwe with the cholera epidemic, when in fact Zimbabwe, which had never really had cholera before because of its lack of access to the chemicals to treat the sewage plants, actually had a cholera epidemic that was very fatalistic to a number of Zimbabweans. So I just encourage us to continue to do this work, to continue to do this kind of campaign work and spread the education to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Omawali. And let me just ask, um, I don't know if, if um, Carlos Ron, you're interested in jumping into the discussion here. And we have just a few minutes uh, left. Aha, uh -huh. hello. Yes. Okay, thank you. I, well, I, I, I share all the views of our, uh, my fellow uh, panelists. I, I completely agree that, that uh, in what they've said. I would just uh, st stress that the last point um, because see, the thing is the United States is getting away with um, issuing sanctions. I mean, this has become a policy that is accepted because it's been normalized. Um, so every, so in, in general terms, um, nobody is looked at uh, differently in Congress if they propose at one point or another to sanction a country. Uh, there is a culture that allows this to happen. There's a culture that uh, basically gives them a free pass. So raising awareness, of course, is vital. Uh, spreading, uh, you know, the sharing with people what, what the consequences are. But there has to be a question, a deep questioning of this logic. Why, why is it that today still, 2000, you know, and, and 21, I mean, we're, we're, we're here, or to 2020, I mean, we're here and we're in the middle of something as tragic as this pandemic, and there's still people defending the use of sanctions, uh, lawmakers, politicians of all sorts, because there's not enough questioning. I think, I think there has to be questioning and pressure, and, and that this pressure has also ha you know, has to take uh, 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 forms of you know, show, not just that it's criticism, but that it, there has to be a cost whether it be an electoral cost or whether it be, you know, uh, 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 some, some sort of, uh, of, of cost in, in, in the political sphere. But they have to understand, they, ha they have to realize that most of humanity is not in agreement with these atrocious acts because these are, this is, this is, uh, these are policies that starve people. These are policies that destroy the economy of nations for years to come and, and you know, and, and, and it really, puts a lot of people, regardless of their political position or where they stand or, you know, anything, they affect whole populations. So the questioning, the raising awareness, yes, the doing these type of, of programs, of course, uh, talking to uh, other groups, uh, having a broad uh, coalition, of course, is important. But, the, but we have to get deep into the questioning of this logic of this culture, this, it cannot be accepted by any country in the world that this is a normal thing, that this is something acceptable for policy. Foreign policy cannot be based on illegality. That's why we have a multilateral system. That's why we agreed to United Nations. That's why we are all part of that. So we have to play by those rules. We have to accept diplomacy. We have to, we have to end this culture where something like, like uh, coercive measures are acceptable as some, you know, as, as, as foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're, we're coming to the end of this uh, program. Uh, I do want to ask everyone, remind them 
uh, and it is on the chat also uh, going forward uh, about signing the international letter, signing the sanctions uh, kill.org pledge. Uh, that's sanctions kill.org slash pledge. Uh, we will see you in three weeks uh, on Sunday, Sunday, that is um, May 31st at 4 p.m. Uh, is there any other comments, uh, ending comments that any of the representatives uh, would want to make? Uh, and these are really closing comments that we very much uh, value because this is such an opportunity and we will make sure that we make good use of very valuable uh, educational material that you have provided here today. Any closing comments that uh, the panelists or those who participated in the program today want to make? All right, I don't see any hands up. And so I will say at, at 5.57, <laughs> we're just closing in. Uh, and from wherever you're watching in the world, it was quite amazing in the beginning of the chat as so many people signed on from countries all over the world and from all over the US. And from those who are watching on Facebook, those who are watching on the YouTube channel, and, and those who see us in streams as we go forward, that it is the actions of the grassroots movement that can be decisive if we are determined, if we're loud, if we're organized, and uh, during a time when we're all told to stay safe and in place, safe means safe for the whole world. It means we cannot allow any, any country to be starved down in this sinister criminal way. So to everyone, uh, we thank you very much for joining us today. And we do urge you to stay in touch with us and with each other. This is how a movement grows stronger through unity and through solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all the audience to be all the time with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, great, excellent. Thank you, thank you. very much for, for organizing such a good meeting, thanks. It's an honor for all of us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Stay healthy, everyone. And Thank stay you. at home. Yes. <laughs> stay safe. <laughs> stay safe and stay determined. Yes. Thank you very much. And today. Everyone's happy. Margaret. Okay. Okay. Margaret, say happy yes. birthday to your son. From all Thank you. Thank <laughs> yes. you. We're getting ready to have Persian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Close down the webinar. Bye. 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 Yeah, la lucha continua. Bye. Bye. The readers have been very active today too, so you'll see this. All right. By the way, there's tons of pledges getting signed coming in already.